back in the uh, mid 80s, uh, the National Science Foundation decided to establish supercomputing centers. And uh, the University of Michigan was one of the organizations that made a proposal for a national supercomputing center. The Michigan proposal had as, a, as its primary hardware artifact a machine that was built in Japan. And uh, I explained to my colleagues, my new colleagues at the University of Michigan having just arrived, that it was highly unlikely that the proposal would be funded. A uh, short while later, I was visiting the National Science Foundation, and uh, I had gotten to know, not well, but had gotten to know Eric Block, who was the then director of the National Science Foundation. Um, and uh, Eric and I had a conversation about Michigan's proposal. Um, and um, it was clear to me from my conversation with Eric that there was no prospect that the Michigan proposal would be funded. I said to Eric, I said, well, it occurs to me that what might be even better for the University of Michigan than having a supercomputing center is to run the network that connects all of the supercomputing centers together. I had an old friend uh, who worked for IBM Research by the name of Al Weiss, um, who's in charge of all of IBM Research's computing facilities. And I called Al and I said, Al, uh, this is a great opportunity, but IBM is going to uh, is is not going to be successful here, and um, I need your help. And so Al sort of rallied some folks from IBM Research, where there actually was work going on in TCP/IP pro protocols. We got tentatively an agreement from IBM that they would contribute the hardware and the software uh, to create the routing uh, uh, structure for the network. But well, we still needed the communications facilities. Um, and um, uh, at that time, um, uh, the CFO at IBM was a gentleman, I think I remember the name correctly, by his last name was Crow. And <clears throat> um, uh, so through IBM, we went to him, and he had contacts with a former IBM employee who was now the uh, 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 network that chief technical officer and essentially the chief network operations officer for MCI? His name was Dick Liebhaber, um, and uh, so IBM uh, approached Dick Liebhaber and asked him if MCI would be interested in providing the communications facilities for this network. Well, as you may recall. At that time, MCI was this fledgling organization. Some people had described it really as, as, a, as a law office uh, trying to create uh, an environment where they could actually offer telecommunications services up against AT&T's lobbying efforts. And they, they had just been successful in that. They were establishing uh, uh, facilities across the United States. And, uh, and Dick Liebhaber saw this as an opportunity to sort of move MCI into the big time um, uh, to be part of this NSFNet proposal. And so we wound up with an agreement um, that we would file a joint proposal with Merit as the principal organization in partnership with IBM, who would build all the routing uh, hardware and software, and with MCI, who would provide the nationwide communications facilities. And while we were, and uh, then we got uh, uh, Governor Blanchard to commit a million dollars a year from state funds <clears throat> in addition. So we wound up being able to submit a proposal to the National Science Foundation, I think for something like $14.7 million, because we knew the ceiling was 15. But in fact, by including all this in-kind uh, activity, it was actually more like a uh, 55 million dollar uh, proposals. It was designed to start at T1 um, or 1.5 megabits uh, with planned upgrades over the over the period of the network uh, network's life. Um, we've subsequently learned that uh, the proposal was received with considerable skepticism by the reviewers at the National Science Foundation. 
uh, people really wondered about our technical ability to pull this off, but uh, the, that review was conducted without um, uh, reference to the actual funding pattern. And then when the wraps got pulled off of the amount of resource that was being committed by the partners to this proposal, it immediately went to the top of the list uh, at the NSF. And, and a, a short period later, we received uh, informal word that they wanted to negotiate with us about sort of working this all out. But we had to do a lot of innovation. Uh, the border gateway protocols had to be developed to allow uh, multiple networks to interact with one another. Um, uh, and we had to build increasingly more capable routing and communications facilities. When we started, the network, um, we had T1 circuits, but there were no cards for computers that would go at one and a half megabits. We used the T1 circuits, we subdivided, and built a mesh network among all of the routers uh, that we put in place. Um, it wasn't for about a year, IBM was actually to build prototype cards that would go at one and a half uh, megabits. When we put those, when we put those cards in our test network, we discovered they they worked just fine. We put them in the production network. The network started failing on us, and we discovered after uh, after a very tough period that the folks who had built the T1 hardware for MCI had planned on using certain bit patterns to do diagnosis on the network and had never anticipated the notion that anybody would ever use a full one and a half megabits as a single channel. They had always thought that it would be broken up into a set of voice uh, circuits at 64 kilobits each. And so they didn't have any worry about these patterns ever appearing on their network. Well, it turned out that that happened uh, with some frequency uh, on uh, the NSF net and it took the communications line down when it did. So they had to re-engineer uh, their hardware uh, to uh, undertake this. We actually had, to, for a short period of time, put some translation circuits in our routers that actually looked for these bit patterns, took them out and replaced them with something else, uh, and then reinserted them at the other end uh, to make it work over these uh, T1 circuits. So we had a lot of adventure. Um, uh, uh, finally, uh, in, I think it was around 1990, this network was growing so fast that it was clear that these T1 circuits were not going to, uh, were not going to enable what we needed to do. So we had to go to the next step, which was uh, DS3, or from one and a half megabits to 45 megabits, which was a very large step, a 30-fold increase in capacity. And in order to do that, um, we uh, wound up creating another uh, not-for-profit organization called Advanced Network and Services. Merritt was still the principal investigator on the grant, but it subcontracted uh, the development of uh, this new network, this 45 uh, megabit network, to Advanced Network and Services, which was headquartered in Armok. Um, and, uh, and IBM, um, MCI, and uh, Nortel who, uh, all contributed $3 million to the founding of this new uh, organization. So it had the, uh, the staff and the uh, facilities to do the innovation that required us to go up to uh, 45 megabits. Uh, that did accommodate um, our capacity needs uh, over the life of the NSF net. The NSF net was the fastest internet uh, uh, network um, to the end. Um, it finally uh, was decommissioned um, in uh, 1995. Uh, when the Congress decided that the federal government should not be in the business of supporting something that by that time, uh, in their view, uh, should have been uh, become a commercial facility. Um, I'll not 
ever forget uh, sitting in uh, a House hearing room in the Capitol um, and uh, uh, next to Mitch Kapoor um, and um, uh, some internet, um, uh, some small internet company uh, startup CEOs who were complaining uh, to the <coughs> Congress that it was inappropriate for uh, the NSF net to be funded by, uh, by the National Science Foundation when they could provide this service uh, as a commercial service. At the very same time they were making that complaint, they were using NSF net as uh, their uh, backup network uh, to carry traffic uh, when their uh, much less reliable networks failed on a national scale. MCI, of course, turned out to be a major internet service provider also using the same technology. Um, uh, in, a, um, in a classic um, uh, innovator's curse moment, uh, IBM, who was at that time the leader in routing technology for uh, internet, uh, for uh, internet backbones, um, managed to decide uh, that they should kill uh, all of the work they had done in developing these routers because it would threaten uh, their proprietary network uh, efforts. It's probably almost single-handedly responsible for the fact that Cisco became the dominant router uh, company in the United States rather than IBM. Thank you.